I think any leader always has a honeymoon period of they get in, do the job, and they will have, you know, the first, what, six to 12 months, and people will look upon them favorably. And even in the polls, even historically, when you look at people like Jeremy Corbyn, Tony Blair, um, Neil Kinnock, all had, when they first got in, very, very high approval ratings. And of course, these will obviously dip and dip and swell, but they all share very, very one common among them. That first six to 12 months was always pretty much a honeymoon period. But we are now starting to see that it's not just like the Labour left that is, you know, starting to say, what's Starmer doing? He's he's not really doing anything. And as we discussed a couple of weeks ago now, you know, Starmer has taken on what is being called Milibandianism. So he's doing nothing to the point where Starmerism isn't even a thing because no one knows what Starmerism is. You know, I'd love to tell you and talk about it, but I can't because even I don't know what it is. But we are now seeing more people in the Labour Party saying, what is Starmer doing? And especially with this by-election coming up, as we've said before, it is going to be a massive big test, not only for Keir Starmer, but the Labour Party itself. So, uh, as always, uh, please do remember to hit that like and share button. And of course, down below, there is a link to my Patreon page and a one-off donation link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can, well, buy me a coffee. And thank you to all those people that do support me that way. And now, on with the article. So, this comes from The Guardian, and the title is... Behind the scenes, Labour MPs are losing faith in Keir Starmer. So, during his punt for the top job, Keir Starmer named Harold Wilson as the Labour leader he most admired, and his predecessor's advice remains apt. The Labour Party is like a stagecoach, Wilson once observed. If you rattle along at great speed, everyone is too exhilarated or seasick to cause any trouble. But if you stop, everyone gets out and argues about where to go next. And it's kind of comforting, very, very comforting, that that phrase sums up the exact same conversations that we are still having now on the Labour left <laughs> and about the Labour Party in general. So it's nice to know that even back in the, the 40s, we were st we, and even now, almost 100 years later, um, we're still almost having the exact same conversation. <laughs> you know? Well, not 100 years, but 70, 80 years on we're still having the same conversation. It's, it's unbelievable, but there we are. <laughs> um, so anyway, it continues. A recent poll suggesting that Labour could lose next month's Hartlepool by-election sent tremors throughout the party. Defeat would further cement the Tories' authoritarian populist grip on the country, but, remains, uh, but the remains unlikely. Constituency polling is notoriously unreliable. And Labour's get-out-and-vote operation uh, gives it a good, thornable edge. The only, uh, only, and only the government, uh, well, there we go, and the government has only taken a seat from its opponents twice in the past half century. But Labour's current malaise is real and keenly felt amongst its parliamentarians. Starmer's team believe that they deserve credit for reversing a huge polling deficit. Labour, they feel, has won back the right to be heard and has a leader who is electoral assets rather than a liability. They acknowledge that their, their lack of cut through and, uh, and attribute it to the pandemic that consumes all of the media coverage. Starmer frequently complains that he has never delivered a speech in front of a packed audience, while his team believe that the death of, that the death of talent in the Parliamentary Labour Party has left him doing almost all the heavy lifting. Their Starmer or Bust strategy is underpinned by the party's phone banking script, which asked voters what they think of the Labour leader rather than the Labour Party. And I think that's a big mistake, to be honest. And this is a risky move. Although Starmer's team blame the vaccine rollout, which is eviscerating 
uh, their charge of incompetence against the Prime Minister for his polling slump, Starmer's ratings bega uh, began their steep descent well before then. He now lags behind the Prime Minister on every measure. It's no longer more popular than the party he leads, and his support among those who voted Labour in 2019 has sharply de deteriorated. In some polls, Labour has returned to its 2019 voter share, and so far uh, that is well below what it chalked up in 2017. This collapse has not been accompanied by the all-out media assault or highly public civil war that defined the Corbyn era. However, across their different factions, Labour MPs believe that the leadership is bereft of vision and direction, and have increasingly concluded that Starmer will never be Prime Minister. Much of Westminster politicking normally happens in a snatched conversations in parliamentary corridors or bars, and the pandemic has shielded Starmer from plotting uh, by of plotting by virtue of MPs basically being siloed, confined to video calls, so that they can't get close to it. The easing of lockdown is now allowing MPs to better communicate with constituents who rarely talk of Starmer, but do not, but do mention the lack of decisiveness and the frequent Labour abstentions. Shadow ministers complain that the not knowing of the party's position on fundamental questions, Labour's recent indecisiveness over the vaccine passport has led party spokespeople to decide to impose on broadcast slots. Many simply fear that Starmer has no coherent political vision and his policy chief, Claire Ainsley, relies exclusively on focus groups of the 2019 first-time Conservative voters rather than developing a policy of her own, hence the recent emphasis on law and order. While some hope that once the pandemic subsides, a vision will emerge that is far more ambitious than that of the new Labour period that, they, uh, that is rarely talked of, the Ten Pledges made during Starmer's leadership campaign, a commitment to uphold the core domestic policies of the Corbyn era and Labour's recent critique of the Tory plan to hike corporation tax violated those promises. Champions of the Labour Together report fear that the party is wasting the opportunity to implement its findings. The cross-faction post-mortem of the 2019 rout committed the party to a transformative economic agenda that, provo that proved very popular with voters and a much trumpeted speech on inequality in February, hailed as laying the foundations for Labour's 21st century offer, failed to offer bold policy commitments suited to the scale of the task at hand. The lack of the killer instinct to get the Tories, uh, which Tony Blair and his uh, spinner Alistair Cam Campbell had in the 1990s, haunts the party. We're too committed to being supportive of the government, as one shadow minister puts it. It leaves people thinking, if you haven't got anything to say, why should we listen to you? Shadow ministers complain uh, complain almost at everyone except Rachel Reeves is kept off the airwaves, including Deputy Leader Angela Rayner, who they say is shut out of leadership division decisions by Starmer's aides. The strategic vision that's the, the, the the strategic vacuum, sorry, is filled by the Labour right, which is conducting an aggressive and highly coordinated briefing war. It rank, its ranks include Peter Mandelson, who believes the policies of the Corbyn era must be comp comprehensively eliminated and the left permanently buried. While the cold water is poured on suggestions of the close association with Starmer, the leader's chief of staff, Morgan McSweeney, is Mandelson's protege. Briefings have particularly targeted the Shadow Chancellor Angelina Dodds, who hails from the party's soft left, but whose own allies concede is bedeviled by, exclusive caution, by excessive caution. The Labour right hopes to displace her and enable the ascendancy of Reeves and the Blairite, uh, Blairite Bridget Philipson, who shares a large part of the blame for preventing the development of racial economic agenda. But... Uh, Sorry, of the radical rate of the radical economic agenda. Sorry. So, as bereft of ideas as Labour's right flank is, it will predict predictably reopen to poor election results in May by demanding a reshuffle that promotes their own by by accompanying a clear a clear abandonment of the Corbyn era policies. Starmer's own team, who some senior figures are believed are arrogant as they are adept at giving terrible advice, will probably concede to this pressure. 
The soft left around Labour's uh, Tribune group have, uh, have settled on a strategy of, uh, of, uh, of hugging Dodds tight, which they would respond to the declaration of war, which sacking her would represent uh, is an unclear. Starmer's purported hero, Harrod Wilson, held up the, uh, the principle of a broad church. His cabinet uh, spanned Tony Benn, Barbara Castle, Michael Foote on the left, to Roy Jenkins, Dennis Healy, and, Sher and Shirley Williams on the right. But the, the, but the leadership election promises of a party united have not been upheld. The sacking of Rebecca Long Bailey and the abstentions on the pretentious, uh, on, 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 sorry, pernicious Tory legislations needing to resignations have emptied the top team of almost most left wingers. And allegedly, MPs are preparing for life after Starmer. The right is coalescing around Yvette Cooper, who alongside Chucky, Chucky Yuman, I think that I say it, assembled a leadership campaign in, ex, in, extent, in expectation of a rout in 26, 2017. Others raised the question of a leadership election unprompted, but no Labour historically never topples its incumbents. If Hartlepool falls, the left will be scapegoated. Despite Corbyn's leadership holding it twice, Hartlepool, a seat once represented by Mandelson, was solidly, uh, solidly leave when, uh, in, late, in 2017 when Labour won its highest vote share and majority since 2001. While Mandelson claims Labour's 2017 surge was fuelled by Remainers angry about Brexit, the contradiction about polling evidence at the same time, constituency polling suggests the overwhelming support for Corbyn-era policies. And the current machinations of the right reveal a refusal to accept any positive lessons from the previous administration. If Starmer wishes to avoid being trapped in every politician's cycle of doom, failing, uh, failing political mixed with constant relaunches, a savaging popular, uh, salvaging popular transformation politics to construct a coherent vision remains his best shot. Otherwise, it will be death by political uh, by, by, by death by political attrition beckons and I think and I worry that may be what happens because while this next by-election in Hartlepool is important what remains important even more is the next general election we have to get the Tories out and unless we have a concrete vision of what we are going to do then we can kiss any chances of the next general election goodbye completely. And this is my big fear. I hope, I hope, uh, after when things start to quote-unquote settle down, we will see a, a vision put forward by Starmer. I really, really do hope that is the case. But I do not fear that will be. Um, I unfortunately fear that the what was said there that the that the the tory the the, the the tory the the labor left is going to be scapegoated and that all the good stuff all the good policies all the very popular policies which were shown to be popular and got people from the red wall to turn out on mass more than they ever have done is incredibly worrying incredibly worrying and i hope we can see some form of 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 good push otherwise what potentially will happen is that the labor right as said said there could take over the party and if that happens all we're going to see is some very very blairite policies and then essentially we can pretty much kiss the next general election goodbye and hopefully they might learn their lesson and then we can say well look you failed we need to build something new and once again, I've said sometimes the left needs to be a bit more pragmatic. Sometimes you're not going to get everything you want. But as I've said before, and I will keep on repeating it, it is far better to have one foot in the door than both feet outside. Because once you've got a foot in the door, then you can start to get some wiggle room in and start to jam that door open wider. So... As always, uh, please do remember to hit that like and share button. And of course, down below, there is a link to my Patreon page as well as a one-off donation link. And as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you all next time.